Hey guys, this is David Bianca, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. This is my man David. We uh, we have been talking a little bit off mic about his latest project, and it's going to get a little heavy, but uh, I promise we all can take it because we're going to talk a little bit about the George Floyd thing. And uh, David's an actor; he's a creator. He makes films, and he made a short. I guess what would you call it? like a spoken word, almost like po a poetry reading, but uh, it's a little bit more than that. And it's because you were inspired by um, everything that's gone on since you know, Mr. Floyd's passing and murder. And it's um, these these pieces of art, these artworks, this show is a representation of that artwork as well, as we all try to understand the human condition to, to, to you know, to continue to, like you were saying, put the right bricks in the right spot as we try to build a better pyramid. Um, you know, we all got to take time and, and listen to some of these and uh, and art is, well, it's one of the best ways. I mean, there are a couple of doors in, in, um, in Italy, in Florence that changed everything, doors just artistic doors. So uh, something like your project is, is a big part of it. Uh, why don't you first tell us, tell us about the project and then we'll uh, get into it even more. Yeah. I mean, even if, there, if there's an opportunity to, to even play a, a, a bit of it for the audience, so they have an understanding of the reference, but um, you know, thanks for having me on the show and thanks for taking the opportunity to just to, to, to talk about the work. So the piece is called, I can't breathe. Um, and that title actually was an evolution because initially when I wrote it, it was called collapse neck. Um, and it's basically my emotional response to um, not just the, the death of George Floyd, but what was what ultimately became the largest civil rights movement in American history as a result of that particular incident. And in the piece, it's a spoken word film, and I produce high concept spoken word films. I'm widely known as a poet, um, and I've competed in national slams, have been televised in many places. And this particular piece was was aired by KTLA. Uh, in fact, they brought back uh, an award-winning series called Breaking Bias to highlight the piece and also interview me about it. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. You know, when we art is fundamentally one of the most important pieces of culture. And it's <laughs> and it's ironic that, you know, when we cut programs in school, arts is one of the first things to go. Because even, yeah. even if you think about the Romans or the Greeks or the Egyptians, you don't remember their politics, but you remember their art and you remember their architecture. Those are the things that stand out the most. And so art is a really an important time capsule of culture. So um, this piece delves deep into essentially just a point of view of a man of color of seeing what's happening at the civil rights level, but also what it means to be of color in America from a historical timeline. Um, part of the reason why I believe it's so effective is because when we put it together, it wasn't just another angry black man spouting and screaming opinion. It was a person having almost a conversation into the darkness about pain because we'll tap out when someone gets angry, but when we feel someone's pain, we'll be drawn into at least to listen long enough to try to understand. Yeah, man. I, uh, well, look, first off, as a, as a person of philosophy, I believe in affect over effect. Mm. And, you know, the, uh, if we're going to use the angry man as an example, you can have 50,000 angry men yell at me. But um, if you can make me feel something, it's like a love letter. It's the example I use. If I can write 15 love letters, if there's no affect, mm. it, it don't matter what I did. So you right. have to you have to approach these things from different ways. And, and you know, what creates an affect for me may not create an affect for you. So we have to have these art pieces, these conversations, these op-eds, you know, all of these things. So because, look, I haven't met a person that's glad that, you know, Mr. Floyd is, is dead and, and who condones laying, you know, putting your knee on someone's neck for almost 10 minutes. I mean, that's that's oh. not what anybody wants. But how do we get to the greater good, you know, and just as an aside, and you're probably not aware of this, I have a project called the Prison Chronicles that comes out next week. Okay. And I'm bringing this up partly to self-promote. Everybody check out the Prison Chronicles. Sure. But also to say, say this, because I heard you say words in your piece um, mm -hmm. about the PTSD that happens. And I'm a, I'm a warrior. I've been in combat a lot. And when I was talking to some of these guys in the Prison Chronicles, we talked to people that have committed murder. Okay. They've grown up in the inner city of, of Detroit, the hard parts of Sacramento, you know, all these different places. Mm -hmm. And they talk when they talk about their home life, they're mm -hmm. talking about what I've experienced professionally in a combat zone. Mm -hmm. And if I've got PTSD, what on earth do they have? You know, when mm -hmm. and one of them is Shaka Sangur, when he talks about eight people from his family all being shot. Mm -hmm. How can you have anything but PTSD? How, and then here's the other thing. And I think this will resonate with you. You know, when you have these kind of environments, 
and this is conversations I've had with people in Iraq, Afghanistan, Egypt, that kind of thing. The young men have no hope and there's nothing more dangerous. You know, that's, that's like O-Dog, you know, young black, it doesn't give a fuck. That's right. dangerous for everybody. And, and why on earth is that person in that position? How do we fix that as a society? You know, and when you said those words about PTSD, it, it you know, if you can recognize it and get the help, maybe you can take better actions. But I was taking, I was having terrible actions, you know, completely out of line with what reality was because of my PTSD. And again, why would that be different for anybody from a neighborhood where all they see are, is danger and death and prison? Sure. And I, and, um, for a while, I mean, thank you for, for being so honest about, about your story and thank you for your service. Uh, I definitely think that that post-traumatic stress, the disorder in and of itself, comes in varying degrees. I mean, depending on how concussive the, the initial event was, purposes of combat. I certainly can't compare my my post-traumatic stress of my experiences of through racism anywhere near as, as concussive as combat post-traumatic stress. Um, but um, nonetheless, as you said, it creates an affect. So whenever something happens outside of me, be it uh, a song or a visual or a civil rights movement, it instigates mm -hmm. that hidden, um, that hidden stress, that that hidden trauma that's been living in me dormant. Because I never know what sort of external stimuli is going to awaken that one thing that's going to remind me of the time, you know, um, you know when when as kids I wasn't able to use the bathroom and I had to shit in the woods because the kids wouldn't let us use the bathroom because the because their white parents forbid us to use their bathrooms in their homes. Or the you know where I, I'm very open about this too. Or the time when um you know one of the girls that I loved that was my my date at the ninth grade formal um you know went to formal and then the next day she was crying in the hallway and for and her father forbid her from seeing me because I wasn't white. It's like these are little things that albeit they may sound trivial or cavalier to the audience, when they pile up over the course of many years and you are constantly in a state of heightened awareness, when you walk into public situations and you wonder who's looking at you, and sometimes they're not, sometimes it just feels like they are because you're so conditioned to eyes being on you that it almost creates an illusion of what's going on. So everybody in, a, in the world that is of color, that lives in a first world industrialized nation in some way, shape or form has experienced some form of racism that has created an invisible trauma and invisible stress. And so when the world saw George Floyd, and I say lynched, not ex execution indicates that he committed a crime that was worthy of him losing his life, right? To be lynched is to be murdered in public display, right? That is obviously akin to how, 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 how slaves and free slaves were killed, uh, mostly in the deep South. Um, so that lynching, when it was saw, when it was seen at a global level, that instigated that post-traumatic stress for millions of people of color worldwide. And for people that weren't of color, were just outright disgusted at the lack of humanity by the hands of this particular officer. And I don't even say his name out loud. Because yeah. there, for this time, there was no but. There was no, yeah, but he had a gun. Or yeah, but he was going in his glove box. Or yeah, but, or yeah, no, there was no yeah, but. The man was dying. The man was pleading for his life. A yeah. grown man was calling for his mother, you know? And so for the world to see that, that slow easing of the life out of another human being, that's what caused this uprising. And so all those things combined with COVID and people being home and desperate and out of money and stressed out and cabin fevered. And, and we already had a whole bunch of distrust for our leadership and what was going on at a societal level. It was the Petri dish. It was the cauldron that was just waiting to explode. And this particular thing uh, was enough to make the cauldron pop. Um, well, yeah. let me jump in here real quick. And I want to continue to amplify what you're saying because you know, these are the kind of, 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 I call it like fence building. When you both build your fence together, all of a sudden you realize culturally you're the same person. And then all of a sudden, you know, race doesn't have to be the dominant thing. So when you talk about the, the, the big concussive event, you know, my PTSD was from years of being hypervigilant, always waiting for the bomb, always looking around, scanning all the time, scanning, scanning, scanning. And my job is to talk to the worst people, you know, that I can find as a spy. I, I have to know bad people. And so you hear, you know, you have this slow burn of, of whatever it is that you have in you that keeps you from having PTSD. And my body physically responds by just jamming cortisol into my brain as a default response. 
Mm. And so now I have to, and this is the same way, like when we look at things like race and we consider them, uh, I have to pause and go, not, not a real emotion, not a real, not a real threat here. I get, okay. Let me give you an example. Mm-hmm. I was at Gabby Reese's house in Malibu and you know, Malibu, it's nice. Yeah. And the, um, their house has a wall around it. And I see that uh, an RV pull up just the top of the RV and I'm mid interview. Right. And I look over my shoulder. What is that? What is that? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just a, it's an RV and it's Malibu. And they're looking at a canyon and seeing the beach. Of course, an RV is going to stop there. There's a turnout right there across the street where you could take a wonderful picture. Mm-hmm. But my brain goes, that's danger. That's threat. Be ready to, you know, and, and I'm like, dude, you have to calm down. But until I built that pause mechanism, you know, it's it's easy to, to make this assumption. And I think the same thing about race is we as humans we have a programmed response to patterns and we get them wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. And so when you begin to like, if you create a scenario in your head, like, Hey, uh, your team wins the world championship and there's people celebrating by burning cars and jumping up and down, you're going to picture someone in your brain and it's wholly unfair to that whole ethnicity, whether it's an Asian guy, a white person, a black, that's not what they all do, but we've seen these things characterized on the news. And so you have to go, yeah, People are partying, they're going crazy, they're burning stuff, but that's people. It's not a ethnicity or a heritage group that that is presenting this. And that pause, you know, that's that's how I try to deal with my own bias. It's like, okay, this is uncomfortable. I don't like it, but let me understand what it is that we're witnessing in terms of, you know, this person's thing. And, and I've done this in Afghanistan, I've done it in Iraq, I've done it in Bosnia, you know, like what it looks weird to me, what makes me reject something because it's not my normal. That's where I have to slow down and do more. work. It's my job to do the work, to understand what there is. I call it miscomfort instead of discomfort. It's just a comfort I don't know. Mm-hmm. And once I'm able to place it into a normal cultural setting, then I'm able to do it. I know I'm going on long-winded here, and I want to get to this next point. Then I really am going to shut up. But when you talk about, the, the, for example, in this case, the black condition, and being out in the neighborhood and not being able to go to the bathroom, uh, you know, being looked at or, you know, an officer's hand is on their weapon. All of these things cause these moments for you to not trust the system. I don't trust the system. Yeah. You know? and, and, and I, I love cops. Yeah, and let me and I can get and I want to create a very, a very layman metaphor for anybody out there that is not of color that's listening to this. Everybody's been in a toxic relationship at some point in their life. Everybody's been with that one person that just kind of did them dirty, right? But you Mm -hmm. stuck around for whatever reason. Maybe you're infatuated. Maybe it was love. Maybe that was the love that you thought you deserved. A variety of reasons people stick around. And so there's a difference between acceptance and tolerance. I accept things about you because of who you are. I accept the fact that, you know, you kind of, if you're a guy, if a girl says, I accept the fact that you leave the toilet seat up every once in a while. I accept the fact that you're not as clean as, you know, my ex or whatever. Okay. But when acceptance becomes tolerance, then it becomes a personal problem. And so the metaphor is that how many little things does that toxic lover do to you, lie to you, not Mm -hmm. show up on time, stand you up, kind of hide things a little bit to the point that you're accepting and then you're tolerating and then you're tolerating and then you're tolerating. And eventually you fucking scream. Yeah. Eventually you you just scream. And so uh, if if that is a clear enough metaphor for anybody that isn't of color, That is sort of like the sort of like micro racism that happens in America nowadays because it's not Ku Klux Klan overt anymore. It's not, hey, nigga, hey, boy, come on, clean this up for me, boy. It's it's not it's not as much that, but it's the little microchips. It's a constant splinter into the spirit that eventually turns into a, 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 a social explosion. What are the things I've been trying to sort out? And maybe you don't have an answer for this. It's, it's a hard question. But, you know, our nation is so receptive to the immigrant dream. You know, people come here from all over the world. We're, we're a fantastically diverse nation by selection. People are like, I'm going to give everything up here in my homeland and I'm going to go to America. And then they do it. And, and look, they don't always, you know, become a millionaire, but they make this leap because of what's here. And yet we have this internal, and we'll use the black example again, we have this internal example where, you know, there's a people mm-hmm. that don't seem to don't seem to have we don't seem to figure out how to make that work. You know, like you have people from all over. I mean, Nigerians come here and do fantastically well statistically. So it's not the color of the skin. What is it about the American black condition well, I think, that is I, so I, challenging? 
I think you're I think you're comparing caviar and pineapples here. Okay. Because if we look at you know recent immigrant Nigerians, let's not get it twisted. If you're moving from a third world country to set up a life in America, you have financial backing, and you have something to substantiate going through the administrative processes of entering with a visa, of getting eventually a working visa, of getting a green card, and eventually maybe gaining some citizenship. So you already go in with a sense of business acumen. So I don't think that that's a worthy example. Okay. The immigration example, yes, we are founded as a nation of immigrants, but we're also founded as a nation of, of, of plunders and pillagers and rapists and burners and killers, right? So we've got that. Now, Ellis Island, is not a worthy example because they don't have what we can call the generational trauma that exists within the African-American and the Afro is experienced throughout all of the Americas, be it South America, Central America, and North America. Because when you look at slave, the slave community that has eventually become the Afro-American community, these people are subjected to 25 generations of poverty as a result of the conditioning that has been in place for all these years. So the thing is, let's give it to you very simply. Okay, slave, guess what? You can't read, you can't write. I'm going to force you to believe in Jesus. It's what's going to be. But now you're free, but you ain't got nowhere to work. So you're just going to come back and crack the whip on my same plantation because that's all you know, nagger. Now, yeah. you take that. And then you got freed slaves. So now you have this police militia that is put in place to control the freed slave and to keep them sectioned off in certain parts of the community and zip codes. Now, you still have an impoverished mentality because you accept the love that you think you deserve at a social level and at an emotional level. You can't read, you can't write, and you are forced into poverty and you are controlled. So now you look at all the way into things like redlining, real estate redlining, that even up into the 1970s was actually fucking legal for banks not to fund real estate that was in specific zip codes that were related to Afro-American communities and Latin indigenous cultures and ghettos. So now you've got all this stuff going on. You've got this, 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 this boilerplate of, of, of hood mentality, of impoverished mentality that has been unfortunately indoctrinated and programmed into the African-American experience that they are programmed to believe that they don't deserve any better to a certain degree. Now, there are great people in the African-American community and there are leaders. I mean, you know, there's a million of them, you know, Barack Obama, LeBron James, Morgan Freeman, Denzel Washington, the list goes on and on and on. And there are men that have risen from the ashes and women that have risen from the ashes of, of, of ghetto and of ghetto culture and impoverished oppressive culture. But to compare Eurocentric immigrants that came into the country seeking a dream that were afforded a dream as a result of not being of color or an educated person of color coming into the country in the 21st century compared to uh, um, a lineage of grandfathered oppression that has been defeated into a people as a result of a system that works because this system is working just fine. It's working against the African-American experience and it's working right. great. I mean, you know, you could look at the statistics all day. Uh, I have 250% chance higher than my Caucasian counterparts of being killed by, by a cop. I have a one in 1,000 chance of being killed by a cop in my lifetime. You look, look at television. I'm an actor, so I know these stats. Film and television is 70%, 72% actually, Caucasian, 13% African-American, according to the Screen Actors Guild census pool. So you go back 100 years to the birth of Hollywood that created a programming of what the actor, the movie star is supposed to look like. Eurocentric, tall, athletic, and stout. If you are not that, you're not a movie star. You're not. No, you are not. And so as a result of that, even me, I'm programmed to believe what an actor is supposed to look like. And I'm a fucking actor. I'm programmed to believe that if, if I don't look like Brad Pitt, well, that's a star. But this guy, I don't know, it's something about him. I just don't know what it is. No, it's because I've been taught to believe that. I grew up on Spielberg movies. I grew up on 80s movies where, where, where white leading men were the men that I had to follow because I didn't have anyone else to follow. Maybe there would be the random black exploitation film, but my mom would slap me on the face if I watched it. You know what I mean? And so, and, and so all of these things that are nestled into the oppressive nature of what it means to be an African-American, and I'm not just an African-American, because if you look at slaves in general, four million slaves were brought to North America and 20 million were brought to South America. So this same system of oppression is rampant all the way through the Americas, wherever there was colonization. 
And so I think that when we draw the comparison of, of as going back to your question, which is immigrants versus the African-American experience, I don't think that we can compare them because I don't think they're standard comparisons. It's almost like, hey, hey, black boy, just, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, I didn't get 40 acres in a mule. Where the fuck do you think the boot's at? I wouldn't give it a pair of boots to begin with. You, yeah, yeah, you told me to go find a job. I can't read and I can't write, and I'm and I'm barefoot. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So, I mean, look, you know, you, <laughs> I love it. I love that we can have this conversation because it is it's challenging, right? You know, when you look at the Reconstruction era, you know, killing Lincoln, good grief. You know, if if uh, if Grant had had something other than corruption from all of his friends that he hired, you know, he was he was absolutely you know in favor of a good Reconstruction. I mean, he. He ended the war because he thought, oh, here's our chance to not have this prolonged multi-generational, you know, internal strife. Mm -hmm. And yet we still, I mean, think about this. How many civil wars end as cleanly, and I'm talking just the, the conflict part, as, as the civil war did? Like they normally go on for, for generations and people have to be wiped out to, to ultimately finish it. We had the advantage of having this relatively, and I'm using big, fat, quotey fingers, peaceful mm -hmm. end to the civil war. But the reconstruction part was terrible. You have Booker T. Washington disagreeing with W.E.B. W. E. Du Bois mm -hmm. and, and how to go forward. And all this, like, within the community and within the government, all this failure, you know, the, the 40 acres and a mule thing. You know, like, the all of that stuff is is part of the legacy that we all share, right? And, and when you talk about trying to find a, um, a comparison point, I keep going back to combat because mm -hmm. I keep seeing – Iraqi men saying, I can't get a job. Oh, no, there's all kinds of jobs. I've said these questions as part of my job. There's all kinds of jobs. You can go to that factory right there. I know they just got a grant. Like, they'll never hire me. I'm not from the right family. It's tribe versus ethnicity, but these are still men that, that even if it's possible, mentally in their brain, it's not possible. And one yeah. of the questions I ask a lot, and I'm, I'm going to shut up after this, you know, I'll say, what does the black community owe itself? And it's one of the hardest questions I've ever asked because it's, you know, it's hard to put your finger on exactly what it is because mm. you can bootstrap. Some people do make it, but as a norm, that's not the case. Go to Detroit, show me bo people bootstrapping. It's sure. very, it's not the norm at all. Nowhere near it. And as a member of society, that's not what I want. Yeah, you bring up um, some interesting points there. I mean, you talk about going to, you talk about Dubois and you talk about that era, you know, Frederick Douglass and all these early yeah all these early founders of what was going to be the new Afro-America. Unfortunately, and fortunately, these were educated men, but everybody has a different version of the ideal. <laughs> you, <Yeah>. know, <laughs> you know, you know, you could talk to five different people and I'll give you a different version of utopia, you know? So, yeah. um, but the good news is, is that progress was and is currently happening. So I don't necessarily want to say that my life sucks, right? Yeah. And all Afro lives suck right now because we are afforded opportunities that our ancestors were never afforded. Right. So let's look at it, since we're talking a little bit about history, let's talk about the historical timeline. Let's look at, you know, 1776. So, you know, America um, historically is oh, 240 something, maybe almost 250 years old. Yeah. Okay. So if we look at that, and then we look at the history of slavery when they were first brought to America to where we are now. So 1964 was the Civil Rights Act, right? So if we put that into context, it's only been 50 years since segregation was a legal thing. Since you and I couldn't share the same restroom and you could be right. physical with me and force me out, right? Yes. That was 50 years ago. That's two yeah. generations, two generations, right. right? So we have to look at that context. Um, what? So when we say that we're that close to systematic and institutional racism, we cannot be so naive as to believe that it is not subtextually and overtly still living in the American populace going back to the days of the Civil War. And the reason why the Confederate flag is such a flagrant image for people that live in the Deep South. And why sure. some of these images like, you know, the, the Indian heads on, 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 on sports emblems and so on and so forth. All these little things sort of play into the micro racism that I was talking about previously. So to get to your question about what can people of color and I say people of color in America, whether we're talking about African-Americans or indigenous, Latino, specific islanders or others, but specifically African-Americans, what can they do for themselves? They can learn to educate themselves to the best of their ability to focus on, for me, 
what got me out of my personal rut was finding a spiritual component of my life. For me, finding a higher power that's a God of my understanding so I could have some faith in my life that I could be the best that I can be. But I think it really boils down to education. You know, racism is taught in homes and it's taught in the streets, right? I'm taught God at home, but I got taught how to say pussy, cock, and dick in the streets, right? So we either learn at home or we learn in the streets. We have to learn how to educate our children. Our Caucasian counterparts have to educate their children to not be racist. The same way that unfortunately African Americans have to teach their children police officer etiquette. Yeah. Because that's part of being African American in this country, teaching your children how to behave around police officers to make sure that you don't end up being one of the 1,000. Um, another yeah, thing. I'm glad you said that. Let me jump in and, and, and discuss the last, that because... the last thought on that. The last thought on that is just Please. Is, is doing the best that we can as a community of, of, of Afro people in America to teach moral compasses and to educate through moral principles. Because these are the things that will protect you from stepping into, you know, ghetto-ish behavior, hood behavior, stereotypical behavior that is going to basically get you compartmentalized. Because if you want to succeed in this country, we as people of color have to work twice as hard. And, and I'll leave it with this. This is a fact that 40% of resumes that have Caucasian surnames on them, those resumes have a 40% chance more of getting called in for an interview than resumes with Afro counterpart surnames. In fact, African-Americans often do what they call, they often whiteitize their resumes to get the interview. Sure. I mean, that's, that's just invisible. So being so awareness is for me is really the key to rising up out of the demise of, of impoverished um, black living in America. Yeah, and, and uh, <laughs> you know, we are squarely in the middle of the conversation and it's a good one. The, the resume thing in general, like the, the veteran thing, same thing. If I apply for a job, uh, you know, I've, I've, got, if I, I've been told, take your veteran stuff off of your resume wow. because yeah, you and would. Think that, I, I would think that that would help you. It is not true. It, uh, but I could say is this: no one said you know plus up your veteran stuff. They said you know write it more you know specific to the company and everything. But I have absolutely been told to not include it because you know look, if I'll be unfair, I'll just use UC Berkeley. Someone from UC Berkeley in the Bay Area sees my resume with veteran stuff on it, whoosh, off to the no pile, you know. And the reason why I bring that that example up is because it, it pairs nicely with what you're saying. First off, nobody calls anybody on resumes anymore. Anyhow, no matter what kind of name you have on it, because it's damn robots that do all the sorting. But um, yeah, that I've seen the numbers on that stuff with resumes, where if you put a, a name on like whatever, just something, nah, something, it's going to get pushed into a different pile just just based on the name, not in the credentials. And yeah, man, Jamal, like I, I big... Jamal, Warner, Jamal Warner is going to get pushed aside over Thomas Park. It's just it, – right. It just is what it is. Just a thing. Yeah. Maybe it happens less than it used to, but it still happens for yeah. sure. There, there's an, again, it's an invisible programming that just says that if you are dark skinned, you're dangerous at night. If you're dark skinned, your intellect isn't as high as a Caucasian counterpart, you know? Um, and, 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 and that's just the way that it goes. And it's, invisible. why does this stuff come down to black and white? And, and why do we ignore so much other ethnicity when we deal with these things? Cause we're not talking about, and I'm using the, capital A Asians all the way across the whole thing. Sure. We don't talk about that. We don't, you know, and oftentimes it feels like they're not included in people of color. So how do, how do we sort out? Here's, here's another thing too, to think about too, is how do we sort out what, what is white? I mean, mm. it's because I understand what you're saying, right? But we don't want to create tribes because right. tribalism doesn't work. Right. And so right. Egyptians technically white, right? Uh, I've, I've had, and I say this all the time. I absolutely disagree. Egyptians that's fine. Out. I'm just saying academically, when they're sorted out, that's that is a definition. Elizabeth, I've had a question. Cleopatra. When Elizabeth Taylor's playing Cleopatra, Egyptians are white, right? Fair enough. If, if you look at the genealogy of that region, they were not white, and there's no way Jesus Christ was fucking white. Okay, so, hold on. Let me let me get my point in here too. I've had a guy who's darker than you in Turkey say I'm white, and I'm like, oh, okay, you're white. Right. That doesn't make sense to me. So. Right. We when we and this is part of the, the idea, right? Like, what is what is white then? Like, we can't just throw people away on any side of this thing. It has to be an inclusive. We have to include each other. We can't we can't use intolerance to create a tolerant system. 
So mm. how do we balance these hard things when we try to sort things out? Because it's really easy to point at me and say, you're a racist. And now what am I going to say? No, I'm not. Right. You know, so we, how, do we, how do we create inclusion as we get this so that we can all get there together? Because like you said, we are getting better at these things, right? We're standing on the shoulders of the earlier generations. But how do we get the progress and not tear it down? Because we've had these opportunities in the past and blown them. Yeah, and I and and I think that you 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 touched on a lot of uh, hot topics there, and and it's a and it's a very loaded question, right? Um, white, again, I let me just preface this to anybody in the audience. Look, I'm not a historian. I am not a sociologist. <laughs> yeah. I'm a pretty savvy dude with an opinion. All right, so take it or yeah. fuck. Um, white and black in America, per your question, are tied into the systemic hate that goes back to the formation of our country that was founded on the backs of Negro slaves. So the idea of black and white were always a constant social cultural battle, right? Even to the point where, you know, Negro dancing, Negro spirituals were actually songs that were had to be influenced by Christianity because white slave drivers would not let Afro sing anything but things that were related to the Bible. Ironically, the only thing that black people hold on to from slavery that they actually love is Jesus, which is fucking weird. So there's that. I, I'm like, hey, whatever. You want to yeah, have, right. you know, you have your Jesus, have your Jesus. I'm good. I believe Jesus was a, was a prophet. I believe he was a teacher and a very, and an incredible human being. I, it's just not my God. Now, with all okay. that being said, there's the black and there's the white. The root of those two words is just separatism because okay. you made it very clear. White is a perception, right? White in America is anybody who is of Caucasian skin with Eurocentric features because anybody who is Middle Eastern in this country is not considered white by the populace. Anybody who is, is, is Pacific Islander, indigenous, Samoan, uh, mestizo, Latino are not considered white. However, there are millions of Latinos that are considered white because they have fair skin and have Eurocentric features. So if you are Eurocentric, you are considered white in this country. The reason for the black and the white is simply separatism. Okay. It is an elite mental perspective that says, I am white and you are black, absence of light, evil, evoking the devil. These are things that are actual dictionary definitions of the phrase black, dark as night, evil, evoking the devil, mischievous, right? So that is fundamentally separatism. That's what that really is. That's what it's all about. So when I speak on racial topics, I often say all people of color, because I know that if you are of color in America, you have suffered racism. Now, this particular movement happens to be happens to be related to an African-American person. And it just so happens that some of the biggest uh, civil rights organizers in the country are Black Lives Matter. They have infrastructure. They've been working at this for a very, very long time. Now, we are at Groundhog's Day, as you said. We have been here before. Yes. What are we going to do differently this time? I think that things are already happening and have been happening. There, there is... Um, district reform, there is local reform and even federal reforms that are going into play as a result of this particular volcano burst, right? I mean, mm -hmm. even if we look at body cams, for example, body cams are the result of civil rights work. If it weren't for the, obviously, the evolution of technology and it being available, but those wouldn't be on officers' chests if it weren't for the work that people have done at the civil rights level. You know, and so every single time that these explosions happen, progress is made, albeit it may be minuscule and you may not feel it. Right. You know, uh, no one's getting reparations, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but but we are making progress. And I yeah. believe that to be true. So and, and we can go back to looking at Afro icons. The only reason that that my Caucasian counterparts and, and, and gentlemen like yourself cared that George Floyd was killed was because of the progress that's been made by our ancestors that made LeBron James, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Denzel Washington, Michael B. Jordan, and all these other iconic people of color made them humanize through media and television and radio and music. Because we have made these people human figures in our life, when we saw a black man being killed, it hurt. Yeah. If that happened, if this happened in the 60s, even if there was television technology, motherfucker wouldn't have been so hurt because there wasn't enough social emotional penetration of the humanization of the man of color and the woman yeah. of color. And also, and my final thought on that is God bless the millennials. 
because they have grown up in a generation where active racism isn't as overt as it was in the 50s and 60s. So my thought is, if you are raised in a household where your father or your mother hate naggers, you are going to dislike naggers as a result of how you were raised. If you grew up in a household where your parents kind of were hot and cold on black people, odds are you're going to be lukewarm to kind of all right because you went to school with them, you grew up. So racism ends when racists die. <laughs> I, and I hate to be so doom and gloom about it, but it boils back down to what are the moral values and the education that you're instilling in your offspring to help create a better place. We are becoming more politically correct, more aware. And um, I think everything um, has a consequence. Some consequences are bad, but not all consequences are bad. Some are good consequences. And I use this metaphor in the poem, and I'll end with this thought, is that I think the, the exact verbiage of it, and I'd like to read something before you, I was just trying to find the file. Yeah. Is that volcanoes must erupt to create new land. Mm -hmm. So when the lava spits up and creates hard form rock with that violent reaction and burns and charred scorched earth, eventually soil collects over it, mustard seeds can sprout, they can grow and they can create new culture. And I think that that's where we are right now where we're in a necessary tectonic shift in American society. And taking a longer term, you know, tectonic kind of view of this thing, you know, that, that rim of volcanoes that makes the Pacific Islands, you know, like Hawaii and everything, it warms the ocean. You know, the ocean isn't warm everywhere, but it's right there. It changes that spot. And and to America's defense, our America, all of us, go look up civil rights and see how many countries have a movement. Hmm. You yeah. know, it, and even though we don't get it right, because we have been here before, we continue to get it better. Yeah. And, you this know, was, and so no, this we can't be so... Yeah. This was Paris, Paris, Copenhagen, Berlin, Korea, Tokyo. This was Sydney, Melbourne. This was wild. Yeah. The world never seen this. I'll give you another example of progress and, and, and take it or leave it. There yeah. was a video of that of that white couple. I don't know what city it was, but they were throwing black paint on the Black Lives Matter yeah. lettering that was painted on a roadway. Now that roadway is state property, right? Yeah. So they were defacing state property, but turns out they were actually charged with a hate crime. That's progress, man. That's progress. That's telling people that motherfuckers, you can't get away with this anymore. Yeah. It's not cool. Yeah, it, it, it's not cool. Let's, it's not let's cool. be clear about that. Wow. But Cops got away with this stuff for a very, very long time. And finally, we're at a point where there isn't full culpability or full accountability, but now yeah. it's dangerous. Well, it's, I, yeah, you got away with shooting somebody in the 1800s, but now you got cameras everywhere and it's a little yeah. trickier now. Yeah, 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 for sure. And, and and for all of the and I can't remember the kid's name, but that that 14 year old, you know, black kid that got hung or, or got executed like in the in the I think it was in the late 50s. It's just tragic that the kid had nothing to do with anything. And I'm so glad that for the most part, we are past those days. But the criminal justice system and this is why I'm doing my prison reform project, you know, like we have to start, we have to look at all people mm -hmm. as redeemable and as rehabil rehabilitatable, because if we don't start with that premise and we start with, um, you know, there's two, there's, we don't have enough prisons, we don't have enough guards, we get this system that that craves young black men. Yep. That's really what happens. Yep. And when I look at the numbers of violence, and this is just across the board, the the ethnic group that has the most likely chance of being murdered is black dudes. Now, a comparable to Hispanic dudes and comparable to Native American dudes, mm -hmm. but you guys suffer this with the biggest number. And no other ethnic group, they all die from other causes, you know. And I'm desperate to try to get this thing figured out. And it's all part of this whole problem of how do we how do we one get young black men to believe in themselves. We have one of our guests talks about this, um, my dark companion that you can't see, but it, it, it's the system, it's your community making you devalue your own life and that of your peers. Mm -hmm. So that violence and pain, and, and I'm not putting this, so everybody to understand, I'm not putting this on black men. I'm just saying that this is what he describes as his bringing up, like I'm from the hood. I, you know, I must exact vengeance. And I've seen this in combat zones where you're like, yeah, my brother was killed, so I have to go kill someone. Mm -hmm. And that person is going to be another male from my set, my group, my people, you know, yeah. and 
these problems aren't dealt with easily if if we're afraid to have progress. I'm all for, by the way, um, cameras and making, you know, if the chest cam does and, and turning it on. No, no, no. It just stays on. It stays on. It, and if there's no if there's no evidence of the, of the video camera, then there's no case. It's dismissed. You know, I mean, like, and have so, a hard even now we have we have video cameras. I mean, you know, God, I mean, you know, we look at Elijah McCain, McClain, for example. I mean, that that poor young man, you know, I, I can't even get into the degree of disgust that I feel for how he lost his life at the hands of overseers because he was just walked to the store. He was overseen and yeah. was and was uh, persecuted um, by a mob and was injected with ketamine and suffered cardiac arrest. So now there were body cams, nothing's happening, nothing's yeah. happening. And you know, and um, it's it's very, very unfortunate. America, and touching on your point, mm -hmm. um, one of the only nations in the world, and again, I'm not an expert on this, but I know that it's one of the only nations in the world that has a major privatized prison system. So, we talk about, you know, black on black crime, right? We as human beings are very, very susceptible. Although we may not believe it, the ego doesn't want us to believe it, but motherfucker, we are susceptible as the wind. You know, we follow trends and movements and whatever social media, whatever you perpetuate to me in the media, that's what I want to be. And in the African-American community, especially in the inner city, we glorify guns, drugs, champagne, bottles, models. That's why for me, I choose to write spoken word to create a higher form of art to give the youth more to look up to than champagne bottles and models, right? Yeah. I choose to take that road. Now, we look at music, for example. Now, this is this is a true story that I heard from a platinum recording artist who actually has a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and I'll leave him nameless. In the 90s, he was a platinum recording artist and still is. He was at a dinner where he was involved in a conversation about the perpetuation of ghetto rap music. And these particular label heads were pushing rap music for one, it's easy to produce because you don't need session musicians. Um, rappers are easy to control because all they need is pussy, weed, and drink. And <laughs> guess what? If you create music that glorifies guns, drugs, murder, and crime, what does that do to the base of African Americans that live in those communities? What do they do? They step into guns, glorifying crime. They step into all this shit, which does what? Gets them to break the rules and gets them into the privatized prisons that are owned by the same record executives. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up. Now, that, now that may be conspiracy theory to some people because nobody wants to believe. You know, it's not a conspiracy. It's, it's a not a conspiracy. It's like, I own the prison. How can I get the motherfuckers in there? Yeah. So there's a couple of things to say about this. There are a lot of countries, and I'm not, so I'm not saying that this is the model, but it is a country that runs their stuff this way. And there's, there's not one of them. There's a lot of them. Yeah. But there's a lot of countries that don't even have a penal system. It's all handled through the civil court and what and i'm using quotey fingers depends on what their court is right. but they don't handle those things by you know because then you have to pay a tax base to, to pay for pay for prisons right. and i'm all for look i support law and order i support our rule of law and all those things and and i know from talking to a lot of very smart police officers they also want to get better they want they're like um sid um sid hale was on the show the other day he's an la county sheriff guy and you know how complex la county is from from the neighborhoods to the topography, you could be in the ocean and on the top of a mountain in the same shift. So, and he was saying it before 1995, all the tools available to us were the same tools that Wyatt Earp had available to him. Hmm. And in the non-lethal era of like the you know from 95 until now, it's like it really hasn't gotten a whole lot better. You know, like and if we can't if we can't choke do a carotid choke and subdue somebody, which is something that actually has to happen at times. Um, what are we supposed to do? Why do we not have any technology? Why don't we have the advancements to, there was a kid in Vallejo who was, you know, look, he was troublesome. Let's just say it. And he was in his car sleeping and um, they surrounded the car with a lot of cops, let's say 15 cops. And it wasn't white. It's just the cops. And there was no real way out of this situation where that kid in the car lives. He had a gun. He had been high, all these problems. And he wouldn't wake up until so finally he did. He went for his gun, and, of course, he dies. Like, this is a situation where you have got him isolated in a car. You can disable the car remotely, 
You know, there's a lot of ways to do these things, mm -hmm. but they don't have these tools available. And so the only tool available was to perceive him as a threat. And when he goes for his weapon, kill him. Now, look, maybe that kid ends up dead a week later from his own lifestyle and, and his own choices. But the cops shouldn't, they should have more capability to have less lethal things happen to him. I want to say something else too. Right. Rachel Robinson, who was Jackie Robinson's wife, she's still alive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they couldn't get on airplanes. They couldn't go to gas stations, all these things. These people still live for sure. And we've got to continue to build on this. And then I'm going to say this about the um, the music thing, because I want to echo your points, because they're good points. Um, an, an artist who I don't want to name because it's, it, it's too problematic to name him, but but a, a black male artist for music was saying he hates the narrative that you have to drink juice and do all these unhealthy eating habits. He's like, look, I look at the diabetes in my community and it drives me crazy. And so I will not promote that. You know, I promote healthy living and being enlightened and educating myself. And, you know, that because when I asked him, like, what do you owe your community? That's what he was saying. He's like, I owe them this. And then another guy we had on Drez from Black Sheep was fantastic. He's like, Black Sheep. Oh, yeah. And Drez is, he's a philosopher. He was talking about, it's back when Kanye was jumping up on stage and grabbing the mic from people. Mm -hmm. He's like, look, I have this recurring dream. This is Drez talking where I'm, I'm in the underground railroad and I'm running away from, you know, my enslavement and I'm running and running and running. I'm scratched and all it's a recurring dream. And he's like, I, then I, I get to some curtains and I open them up and I'm out of breath and the dogs have been chasing me and there's a microphone there. What am I going to say? That's how I approach my message. Hmm. Not, not something vapid, not hmm. something about hose and something that's misogynist, but like take this, you know, like you're doing, Mm -hmm. Put some real powerful messages in that, and his his rap about his son that he did a couple of years back is it's like I, I I let you walk in front of me so you can learn how to lead, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. yeah, just powerful powerful messages. I love that. And then the next thing I want to say because I got a lot of things to say. Yeah, I know, um, but it's all good. Get it out, man. I mean, look, this is this is a challenging conversation, right? Yeah, yeah. We're talking, we're having the uncomfortable conversations that many Americans are either intimidated, afraid, right. or too trepidatious to step into. So I applaud you, you know, as as one of, as a Caucasian counterpart to be able to step into this dialogue and go toe to toe with it because yeah. these are real issues and, and, and communication is fundamentally one of the most important ways to get to the next step of what is going to be the new social chapter in America and in the world. Well, wow. and, and look at the examples I'm giving you are examples from my show, because I use the show as a way to bring perspective into things. And and I, I hope you don't think that we disagree because I'm, you know, I want I, this I, to I be. I, I actually don't think we disagree. I, I'm, when, you know, I think that your I think that your perspectives are, are, are you know, are parallel and are, are supporting some of my positions. But, yeah. you know, we're, but I'm not I'm not being um I'm not trying to be uh, uh, negative towards, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm not trying to be negative towards cops. I'm not trying to be negative in any way, shape or form. I am actually pro police officers. I know a lot yeah. of police officers that are great yeah. guys. But, you know, the the abuse of power is where the problem lies. I was yeah. in Santa Monica, you know, when they started firing flashbangs and tear gas at us. Yeah. And it was a peaceful protest. Yeah. But when they started moving the wall marching towards us in military fashion, it reminded me of the Civil War. Because that's how we fought during the Civil War. It was an avant-garde marching wall. And so as a result of that, um, you know, what it created was it created a tension of war. It created an us versus them situation. They started firing tear gas and so on and so forth. And then what is that? What happens? Now that creates massive social unrest, massive distrust. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and the looting and the burning, like, for whatever it's worth, guys, take it or leave it, that shit was necessary. Now, I'm not pro-damaging small business, but if there wasn't looting and burning and destruction, it wouldn't have been a national story, which wouldn't have made it an international story, which wouldn't have us where we are right now. Hence, volcanoes need to erupt to create new land. Let me, uh, let me get back to my – and this is great. I, I love having this conversation, and uh, you can see Adafo's quote, but he talks about even if we did disagree, this is how we learn. And I totally agree. And, again, this is where, like, my show teaches me so much, my experience in combat and then all these examples. I don't know if you know who Hilliard Guess is, but he uh, he is a co-chair for the – got to slow down when I say this – the Screenwriters Guild West's Black Committee. So he okay. and his other co-chair and their vice chair wrote something – 
um, to the entertainment industry. And I know this will resonate with you. And then Hillier came on the show to talk about these conversations because we can't be afraid of these things. And when we look at Aunt Jemima and go, can't we, what are we doing? Let's get to something. He and his peers wrote to Netflix, to Hulu, to Amazon, all of these production houses and said, okay, you're all on board. You, you want to support, you know, what we're all doing here and, you know, Black Lives Matter then we believe you and here's what you need to do. You need to hire more of us. We're, and, you know, just like your study on the actor side, the same thing, you know, UCLA studies this, the guilds study this. And when you look at how many writers and how many everything else, and so, I, but what we don't want is like the war on drugs, the war on poverty, where we have these long nondescript things, but Hilliard's like, here's what we need. Well, we don't need, we don't need more wars. Right. I mean, and again, I'm a civilian, so I'm, I'm very trepidatious about using that term and how I use it in the public space. But what we do need is not more war on drugs. We need more support of the people that are suffering from addiction. We yeah. don't need war on poverty. We need people that can work in the space of mental health, that can work in the right. space of recovery. See, me, myself, I'm very transparent. I'm, I'm, I'm over three years sober. So hey, I great. Yeah, good job. Thank you. You don't get sober because shit was good. You get sober because <laughs> shit sucked, right? Yeah, yeah. You get to a point of absolute desperation where you figure out that there's got to be another way. And well, so he, I want to, I want to say this, or I lose this thought. In infrastructure, and thank you. Me me. So he was saying, what I want to see in in our industry, your industry, his industry, is um, black faces looking back at me from across the table when I'm pitching projects, and they've got green light capability at mm -hmm. Hulu. At yeah. Amazon, he's like, when I walk around and I go to, because he pitches things all the time, he's like, I see white faces, mm -hmm. you know, and and that has to change in general. We need to see throughout the entire organization more of representation of of what the community is. And if the arts can't do it, well, then how in the hell are we going to get a dead elsewhere? Like, we have to represent these things in a way that is right. Because Brad Pitt is a great looking, you know, leading man. But, but, you know, we need a lot more of those men from a lot of different, you know, ethnicities and, and not just, you know, versions of white dudes. You're absolutely right, man. And, and I love that reference and it ties into what I do professionally. You know, look, I joined the television. I'm a member of the, of the Academy of Television, Arts and Sciences. So I vote for who gets nominated for the Emmys and I vote for who wins the Emmy. My vote counts. Um, I didn't join that that cool kids club for pats on the back and spotlights. I joined it because I wanted to be able to influence, at least have my vote count on the inside. Yeah, yeah. Able to do exactly what you're talking to, which is sway the current just a little bit, even if it's just a tad, every single brick builds the cobblestone road. It's just the way that it is. And, you know, I faced this, I spoke to a very powerful casting director uh, on a virtual situation. I asked her a question, she cast Narcos. Um, and, um, you know, I said, hey, you know, when are you, are you gonna be able to get to a point where you're gonna cast more Afro-Latinos? Because me being Afro-Latino, I speak native Spanish, I speak native Portuguese. And so, but we are not represented in television because there's the reality, which is there's hundreds of millions of us. And then there's a perception that to be Latino on television, you have to look like Antonio Banderas, or you have to look like Penelope <laughs> Cruz or Sofia Vergara or whoever else. And her response was, David, I love Afro-Latinos. I love to support Afro-Latinos, but unfortunately, I don't have roles for Afro-Latinos. So for people that don't understand that, when a screenplay is written, then ah. so, so for each character, when it goes to casting, there's what's called a breakdown. And the breakdown yeah. is, okay, Afro-Latino, 35 years old, bald head, light skin with a beard. That's a breakdown with an arrogant attitude. That's a breakdown, right? Those breakdowns don't exist because the people that are writing the scripts are Latino of Eurocentric descent. So they're writing stories filtered through their contact lens of their social experience. So this is why diversity behind the camera at the writing level, at the producers, at the directors, at the cinematographer, at the post-production level, this is why this stuff is so important. Because like you said, if we, and God bless Brad Pitt because Plan B is an incredible company and he, you know, Brad Pitt, he, he produced 12 Years a Slave. He does incredible work. Um, and that's yeah, all yeah, yeah. the social philanthropy that we need from, from, from Caucasian actors, but we do also need to, 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 you know, bend the curve a little bit behind the scenes in Hollywood, not just in front of the camera. Yeah. Well, and it's not just that, you know, it's not just Denzel and, and Idris Elba, you know, like, I mean, any of the, the, the black folks that are carrying movies by themselves and thank God there's more of them, there's only but just in general, like you said, working <laughs> you, behind the scenes, you can, count, you can probably count on one hand. Yeah, Maybe yeah, what, yeah. How many how many black actors could green light a studio level movie? So we're talking fifty million and up. 
Yeah. J- Jamie Foxx, Will yeah. Smith, um, The Rock. Um, who else we got out there? Maybe Morgan, Denzel. Who else we got? Maybe, I mean, maybe Michael B. Jordan. I don't even. It's, there's not quite yet. Not quite yet. yet. So there's there's only a handful of them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a tricky yeah. it's a tricky playing field. Yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. Changing, it's changing. You know, and I'm up. Yeah, and and leading through art is 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 a fantastic way to approach this thing because you know, and again, and Hilliard's point was not just the actors, not just you know the writers but also the people that operate the machines that build the sets throughout the entire, all the guilds that handle these things need to have better representation. And and you're right, that that producer that sits there and says, why does this person have to be this kind of character? Can't we, ex- can't we play with this and bring someone else in? Because you're right, someone from Brazil. Like you can look at someone from Brazil and you, or, or from Venezuela, and you'll never know like what, what their ethnicity is just by looking at them. They could be anything. It could be a wonderful mix of things, but you never see them on TV or in, in movies reliably. You won't see them a lot. You, you just don't. You just don't. And, and look, it also, again, and the reason for this, and this is, again, a very, I'll be very general, but the reason for this is the grandfathering that goes all the way back to colonialism, racism, and everything tied in, in, in between. Because it wasn't until the early 70s where Melvin Van Peebles, Mario Van Peebles, came up with a movie called Sweet Sweet's Badass Song that was supported by a Black Panther Party that ended up being the biggest blockbuster ever created by a Black filmmaker. Now, that movie proved to the studio system that there was this thing called black exploitation that Black movies could actually make money. As a result of that, Shaft became a Black actor. Shaft was initially scripted to be a white guy. So as a result of that, there was this boom of this movement called black exploitation. Now, there, the, the lineage of that indicated through the analytical data of box office that black films going all the way into the early 2000s were only going to make a certain amount of money at the box office. So what that tells production companies, it says, well, you can't spend more than $20 million on a black film because you're going to lose. In fact, George Lucas, who executive produced Red Tails that was directed by a, a friend of mine, that there was a big uh, controversy in Hollywood because it was a $50 million black film and nobody wanted to distribute the film because they were afraid it wouldn't make the money back. You know, because of the grandfather going all the way back, there has been um, analytical and statistical evidence as a result of the grandfather that black films only make so much money. And so that's why black stars are undervalued. We almost had Mario on the show the other day, and I'm hoping we still get to book him because I would love to talk about his dad with him. I mean, look, Mario's got his own legacy, but his dad, not only does he get funded by Black Panthers, he's also, you know, he's also one of the Gorilla independent guys. He's like, this shot's got to get done right now. Uh, submit for the permit. We'll go shoot it. And then by the time they figure it out, we'll be gone. You know? I, uh, yeah, man. That's why you have to. I'm an I'm a indie fucking filmmaker, man. And when I, you know, when you got to get it done, you get it done. And, you, you know, I, done. I produced, my last movie that I produced, uh, Hulu picked it up and uh, we got a good release on it. I wrote it, produced, I played, I, I played one of the leads. And when I was putting that together, I needed an internship. So I called up one of my buddies who worked for the Hollywood Black Film Festival. And I says, look, I need a certain amount of internships and I want to bring in only black interns. Because I can't eventually have a black cinematographer unless he learned how to PA when he was 22. Yep. So it's like all of, whenever I can, I try to cast a net to offer positions to people of color. I'm in post-production on a project right now, and it's called, and I wrote it, it's another spoken word film, very powerful piece called Wade in the Water that's, that's uh, inspired by the old Negro spiritual. And I needed a, a composer. I needed a sound designer. I needed a mixer. I needed a Foley artist. I need all these people. And I got, I put a breakout. I got 70 applications. Out of those 70 applications of qualified people, only two were of color. Yeah. Two. That's a staggeringly low figure. And as a and as a business person, I can't give away a key position to someone just because they're of color. I have to give it to the best person that's capable to do the job that will fit yeah. my budgetary parameters. <laughs> it's like, so <laughs> we yeah. so we have to do what we can where we can, but also right. without sacrificing the integrity of what we're trying to create. You know, the movie that made Arnold Schwarzenegger the most money was Twins because no one be- would believe he could do a comedy. But him Hilarious. and Ivan Reitman and Danny DeVito funded it themselves, you know, and that's, Hilarious. I mean, that's, 
it, that is always the case. The good news is, is it's always possible to do that, to go out and say, I'm going to make this motherfucker myself and then, and then get it done. You know, the bad news is, is that the system, and, and again, like you're talking about the same thing. I've got a budget. I have to hire someone who's going to come through for me because I need to be able to get a bigger budget next time and I've got to come through. And the mm -hmm. same thing with distribution. So these things can move, but it does take these small, these, you know, that 22 year old PA. And by the way, I'm going to push you on this. Great. Hire people of color. Get a couple of veterans in there, too, because there's plenty of veterans of color that are out there in the industry that would love to do this work and work their hearts out for you. And I'm not saying that you don't do that, but just have that in the back of your mind. Like, that's right. Let me find me some veterans, too, because those guys are out there and they're hustling, trying to get it together. Yeah, um, agreed. Agreed. I've had you for about an hour. Do you want to read some of your stuff for us? Yeah, I'll, I, I would like to, man. And, um, you know, you, you really gave me a lot to think about. And, um, you know, on, I was closing the last thought on film, you know. As much as we oftentimes independent artists want to believe that we're working outside of the system, right? I'm going to go fund my own movie. I'm going to make my own movie. I'm going to do it without permission. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Yes. Oh, cool. Now, only rarely do you strike lightning in a bottle like Melvin Van Peebles, for example, where he couldn't get distribution. So off the back of him hustling, it got hurt by the Black Panther Party and it blew up on the strength of that. But rarely do you get an opportunity because even if you make a movie that whatever you want with your own money, you direct it, you produce it, you release it, boom you still have to ask for permission at the distribution level. You still have to ask, you still have to show it to them and say, uh, will you please release this and, and help me pay for the money? Yes. You still yes. have to, even if you don't do that, even if you're going to a film festival, <laughs> you still have to get them to accept it and screen you. So yes. um, you're always working within the system. So I don't want anyone to have any illusions of grandeur that you're not. Um, yeah. Uh, but well, yeah. look at my Prison Chronicles project. I can't get anybody to call me back to help lift up this incredible story, you wow. know? Wow. And uh, what is more topical than prison reform right now? Come on, you know? But you're right. Well, the, only person, uh, the only person I think of in that category would be like someone like Ava DuVernay. Um, yeah. You know, she is she's a, a such an icon right now. I'm so honored to by her just seeing and witnessing her work and so many people around her atmosphere. Um, but yeah, I'll read a bit of this piece. Um, Let's do and, it. Um, you know, it's uh, the whole piece is running about five minutes. You want me to do the whole bit? You want me to just do an excerpt? What do you want me to do? No, I think you should rock that whole thing, man. Do it. It's your mic. I'm going to shut up and sit back and enjoy. Okay. Is it really not enough when the rubber bullets fly? When the world is enraged from watching a black man die, gasping for breath, and the man says, I can't breathe, his esophageal tube collapsed under a man's knee. Is it not enough to wake in the wake of hate perpetuated by a system dating back to Negro slaves? Beat that black man, make him pick cotton, shoot that black man, it looks like he's up to something. Is the American fury not enough for you? Crowds plowed through, driven by the men dressed in blue. Who do you call when the cops are the killers? When the body camera footage shows you murdering my brothers and sisters. Is the execution of a man not enough for you? Judge, jury, and executioner by the man dressed in blue. You look down at us for behaving like an angry mob. But if every man is created equal, what gives you the right to play God? Where is the leadership? Where is the fight? Four days to be arrested for murdering a man in plain sight and a nine-day riot to arrest the other three, right? Did it maybe occur to you that our hearts are broken, that we're tired of being hurt and our culture not moving forward? Be it Selma, Malcolm X, the death of Dr. King, Freedom Riders, Bloody Sunday, I can hear the choir sing. Rosa Parks, L.A. Riots, the beating of Rodney King, Eric Gardner, Philando, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. Can you feel the sting? You'll arrest hundreds of voices in generations to come when all you had to do was show us justice for one. Now you've created a resentment that will stretch a generation that will instill fear in the police administration in the eyes of young people who know what is right. Trusting in the biblical law of thou shalt not kill, right? Aren't you tired of the pain, the anguish and the struggle? Aren't you tired of the fear, the disdain for one another? Aren't you tired of the intimidation? Injury and the judgment.
do I do I look infected to you because I'm not white? Do you see me as evil without blue eyes in my sight? Am I not human? Do I not walk upright? So why do you beat me? Why do you shame me? Why do you draw your weapons on sight? Yes, yes, officer, I'm talking to you. The people representing the red, white, and blue for the broken eye sockets and the rubber bullet concussion, tear gas, billy clubs, inciting more violence. Yet another reason to protest, another reason to scream. Trace it back to the slave days and everything in between. The looting and the destruction is a side effect of our scream. The world protested and marched and we cried, stop the racism, please. Make police brutality die. And this ain't just about blacks. This is for all of humanity so we can live in a country where we can feel protected and free. Is it not enough to see a black man shot in the back, running from a man with a badge, pistol cocked back? The ticking time bomb has exploded and we can't afford to wait and see if justice will be served or will be another black man hanging from a tree. You see, volcanoes must erupt to create new land and violence is sometimes the answer to a heavy opposing hand. And a fire and brimstone evoke justice in a conversation. So now I pray quietly for an answer to our situation. Now, I have faith that humans will pass the next social test, but I'm not sure the world can handle another collapsed neck. <laughs>